Yes, now, Miss Ojudiku, we were sorry to hear that Miss Brazier has been taken ill and very recently, and we send our collective best wishes for her speedy recovery. Um, our thanks to you for stepping into the breach at, at very short notice. We, we, we're very grateful. And we're grateful to those behind you and uh, those within the, the, the court office uh, who are involved in making the, the last minute changes of arrangements. We're, we're being live streamed, um, so it will be necessary, please, for the parties to be referred to simply as mother and father and the children as, as da daughter and son. Indeed, my lord. <coughs> Now, <coughs> just um, to, to deal with a, a bit of preliminary uh, housekeeping, if we may, um, we're aware that there may or may not be uh, an application to adduce some further material. We'll consider <coughs> that if and when it arises. Um, <coughs> the, the, there are five grounds of appeal, the first four of which, broadly speaking, challenge the judge's overall evaluation of the, the evidence, uh, and the fifth of which um, challenges the, really the, the, the fairness of the proceedings from the, from the mother's point of view. Um, and so it may be that the, the, the fifth ground covers to an extent the, the other four grounds. So um, if it's convenient, by all means start with ground five, if it's not convenient, we, we don't want to take you out of your preferred course. I'm grateful, my lord. My lord, shall I introduce the party? Yes, of course you can, yes. May it please your lordship, I appear on behalf of the appellant mother who sits behind me, yes. together with my instructing solicitor. Uh, Mr Collins um, represents the first respondent yes, local you. authority, uh, and I understand that his instructing solicitor and the social work team sit behind him. Right. Uh, Mr. Schmidt represents the second respondent father, who sits behind him together with his instructing yes. solicitor. Um, and my learned friend, Miss Cheatham, uh, represents the third and fourth respondent children, yes. who are their children's guardian, who sits behind her, right. together with, I believe, her instructing solicitor. Right. And grateful. Uh, my Lord, I, I should say, um, b before uh, I, I commence, I'm instructed to pursue the application for an adjournment, which oh. I understand was made yesterday. Well, uh, yes and no, <laughs> he, he said unhelpfully. <coughs> the, the, there was an application which rather surprised us because it arrived two hours after we had been told that no application would be needed because happily you were able to take the brief. And then when we <coughs> sought clarification of the, the later application, we were specifically told that it was not pursued. My Lord, can I turn my back for a moment? Yes, of course. Yes. <clears throat> I'm grateful, my Lord. My Lord, my instructions are um, that at the time that the application was made, um, it wasn't clear whether or not the mother would have legal representation today. Yes. Um, but she attends today. Um, she has considered matters um, and feels that she would rather be represented by counsel who represented her at the contested hearing. That's the first premise upon which I seek an adjournment. Um, the second is that, my Lord, there are some outstanding evidence uh, which is not before the court. My Lord will see that an application is made, and this will be addressed at the end, um, to adduce further evidence, amongst other things, um, in the form of a report from the family support worker um, and the autism assessment with regard to um, the second child, who I will call um, D2, and I'll come back to the children. Um, my instructions are that the family support workers report um, is available. It was sent by the <coughs> family support worker to <coughs> the local authority having completed it, um, but it was never circulated to the mother. So effectively it was available at the time of the hearing, 
um, <coughs> but wasn't made known and wasn't before the court. Yes. My Lord, with regard to the autism assessment, my instructions in that regard is that that hasn't started yet. Let, may I just confirm? I'm grateful. Um, just to correct that, the report itself has been concluded, but it hasn't yet been circulated. Yes. But it will be available imminently, I'm sorry. Right. Sorry, <coughs> my Lord, I'm told it will be available in ten weeks' time. Ten weeks? Ten weeks' time, although it's apparently been concluded. Slightly surprising um, sequence of events to complete the report and then leave it for ten weeks before showing it to anyone. My Lord, that's what those who instruct me have been informed. May I ask, uh, if I may, Roger Dickey, looking ahead, <laughs> if this appeal succeeds, what are you going to be inviting the court to do? Are you going to well, what, I, I mean, what, what, what do you say we should do? My Lord, in the event that the appeal succeeds, I would be inviting the court to remit the matter to be further considered. Um, or for, for a, a rehearing. Re for a rehearing. And at that stage, of course, all this further evidence would be produced. <coughs> hopefully, would be available and could be considered. Indeed. Okay. Perhaps one, one final piece of information before we, we hear from other counsellors. <coughs> we, we, without wanting to delve into any personal or medical details, um, since, since the first ground of the application is that the appellant uh, understandably would, would wish the, the same counsel to be able to represent her, do, do we know anything about the likely timetable of when Miss Brazier will be back? Back to full fitness? My Lord, I <coughs> attempted to inquire. I'm afraid we don't know. No. Um, those who instructed me were informed by Miss Brazier's um, senior clerk yesterday that she was unwell, but um, it's unclear how long right. um, she's likely to be <coughs> away for. Okay. All right. Th th thank you. We'd we'll better hear what, what other counsel have to uh, say. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Collins. My Lord, and sympathet sympathetic as we are to Miss Brazier's position. <clears throat> uh, the local authorities' view is that the hearing should proceed today uh, for finality, really, for all parties. My lords are aware, I think the appeal has been adjourned once already, quite properly, to get the transcripts. Uh, Miss Brazier, to her credit, has filed a very full and comprehensive skeleton argument setting out uh, the mother's case. <coughs> all other parties have filed uh, detailed uh, responses. So our position is that the um, unfortunate as it is. Uh, we need finality, particularly for these children who have been waiting well, quite a long time uh, to find out really what is going to happen. So we oppose the application, my Lord. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr Schmidt. My Lord, thank you. Um, my Lord, I would query whether my learned friend for the mother is in a position to advance the appeal, given the late instruction. Uh, if, if the position is that she, she is so able, um, and therefore the appeal can be conducted fairly and the parties are on an equal footing. It seems to me in those circumstances um, we would oppose the appeal uh, and the preferment of counsel that represents her at the hearing uh, should fall away in the face of the delay that would be occasioned by a further adjournment to this matter. So we oppose the appeal. Thank you very much. Yes, Ms Cheatham. Thank you, my Lord. Yes, the Guardian also opposes the application to adjourn um, these children <coughs> need decisions to be made about them um, urgently and whilst of course one has uh, sy sympathy not only for Miss Brazier but also for my learned friend who has stepped into the breach yes. um, rather heroically <coughs> if I may say so um, in order to uh, represent uh, the mother um, but there is so much in, in writing um, yes. that is available to the court in my submission there is no prejudice uh, to, to the mother's ca case and uh, in any event the needs of the children outweigh uh, the difficulties that it, it uh, gives rise to on behalf of the mother. So on that basis we oppose the adjournment. Okay, thanks. Uh, Miss Odridika, did you want to say anything by way of reply to the, the individual collective opposition? Um, 
No, my lord, save that. Um, of course, I was instructed yesterday and I've read yes. all the papers uh, and I have been able to prepare yes. um, in the event that the appeal, the application for an adjournment is not granted. Yes. All right. Um, thank you very much. We'll just rise to consider that application. <coughs> Well, Ms. Ojudiku, uh, we're, we're of, of course sympathetic to your um, personal and professional position, uh, and we reiterate our gratitude that, that you have been able to step in. But we <coughs> are not um, willing to uh, adjourn. Um, the <coughs> the, 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 this is no criticism at all. Um, but both the matters you've put forward, namely the understandable desire of the appellant to have continuity of representation and the prospect of <coughs> further material going before the court, if permitted, uh, are both in terms of future timetable some somewhat open-ended at the moment. Uh, all, all parties are in a position to proceed <coughs> today and we should perhaps mention that um, each member of the court has listened to the audio recording of the section of proceedings, namely Miss Brazier's closing submissions, which the court was asked to listen to, um, <clears throat> for, for, for reasons which I'm bound to say somewhat elude us. Uh, that was only practicable by e each of us going to the central family court and uh, squatting in somebody's courtroom du during the, the lunch adjournment. So in terms of a, an adjourned date, uh, either that would involve a good deal of duplication of work by other judges, or there would be serious timetabling difficulties in trying to accommodate the other commitments of myself and my lord and my, and my lady. So we, we, we're against you. If at any point in the hearing we, we think that there is a real danger of prejudice to the appellant, arising out of the, uh, the, the late change of counsel, well, well, we'll review the position at that stage. My Lord, I'm grateful. My Lord, right. <coughs> concerned with the welfare of two children, um, D1, who is a female, aged 13, and D2, who is a male, aged 10. Uh, my Lord, this is an appeal um, against the judgment and decision of Her Honour Judge 
accuse Casey as she then was um, on the 10th of March 2023, whereby at the conclusion of a five-day contested hearing, uh, the learned judge um, made care orders in respect of the two subject children. My Lord, I should say there's a younger um, child, a, a baby, who, who was one in April, who doesn't form part of these proceedings. Th that child is living with, I can't remember if it's a boy or a girl. The mother. With, boy's father. That's right. Thank you. Yes, I'm grateful. My Lord, indeed. But they live together, so um, the baby stays with the mother and his father. I'm sorry, I hadn't appreciated that. Okay. Thank you. Um, my Lord, do you wish me to go through the background? Well, uh, uh, <coughs> y y you can... Um you can proceed on the basis, Miss Andrew as can all counsel, that we, we've read all the papers. Okay. We've got a good working knowledge of the, the chronology of events and the important matters relied upon. So, I mean, by, by all means, um, draw our attention to particular features in the chronology if, if you wish to, but, but you don't need to in order to inform us of the overall framework of the case. I'm grateful. Uh, my Lord, um, as indicated, by your Lordship. There are five grounds of appeal uh, and subject to um, your Lordship's permission, um, as indicated, I propose to start effectively at the end yes. uh, with the fifth ground because that effectively um, colours the other ground uh, and it may well be that if that ground is found to be met um, then um, <coughs> your Lordships will con either consider the others um, or the others may fall away. It, it all depends, of course. Uh, my Lord, that um, fifth round is, is ground E, um, and permission to <coughs> appeal was granted um, in respect of how that round relates to the learned judge's management of the hearing, and in particular, um, the closing submissions made by counsel for the mother at the conclusion of the hearing. My Lord, that's the emphasis. There's also reference made um, to the conduct of the learned judge during the course of the hearing, uh, and that included, amongst other things, um, that previous counsel w was not permitted um, to make interim submissions. Um, there was also an issue whereby um, counsel was not given sufficient opportunity um, to confirm the mother's instructions following um, the guardian's change um, of position. My Lord, with regard to the closing submissions, um, can I confirm that your Lordships have the um, transcript? Thank you. It is in the Bible, it's at page 612, it starts in the set of Mr. Gazia's closing submission. Yes. I'm grateful. J j just, um, um, sorry to interrupt you, Ms. Ojadiku, um, but just to perhaps um, clarify one point so that it's, it's out of the way. I mean, you, you referred a moment ago to the Guardian's change of position. Um, Perhaps it's more accurate to say um, <coughs> setting out uh, of, of position, because the, the the course of the hearing was that on the Friday before the hearing began on the Monday, the guardian I indicated <coughs> that she wished to listen to other evidence before finally <coughs> deciding uh, her stance on behalf of the children. <clears throat> and that she did on, I think, was it the, the Wednesday afternoon of the, the hearing? That's my understanding, my yes. Lord, yeah. So, so n n not a change in the sense that the hearing <coughs> began with her saying one thing and ended with her saying something else, but a, 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 a declaration of the stance which was not known at the beginning of the hearing. Indeed, my Lord, I'm, I'm grateful. 
My Lord, um, I, I've taken that from the skeleton argument prepared yes. <coughs> by Ms. Brazier. Um, and the context to that, as I understand it, is that prior to um, the receipt of the Guardian's final analysis and the um, accompanying position statement, the Guardian's position had been that she had supported the local yes. authorities' care plan um, for there to be supervision orders. Um, but then, um, upon receipt of those documents, the Guardian's position was that she sought to hear the evidence before making a final decision. Yeah. Um, my Lord, um, in addition to that, um, it was also asserted um, pursuant to this last round, uh, the fifth round E, uh, was that um, I think I've said that there was insufficient time given for Ms Brazier to confirm <coughs> my position. Um, it's also fair to say that cross-examination of the father um, by the Mother's Council was somewhat hampered um, in circumstances whereby no other advocate was asked to curtail their questions in cross-examination, and yet Ms. Brazier's was. Yes. My Lord, with regard to the closing <coughs> um, submissions, um, may I take your Lordship to the transcript? Yes. <coughs> and in particular, Ms. Brazier's closing submissions commence at 612, of 720 of the bundle, which I hope um, your Lordship has. Yes. Uh, and my Lord, um, of course, submissions are made in this regard in the skeleton arguments, which are relied upon. Um, and it's right to say um, that, certainly in my respectful submission, there's a distinct difference to be made whereby a judge robustly engages with submissions that are being made um, or asks questions that serve to clarify matters uh, or indeed explain matters. Um, but reading the transcript, I haven't had a chance to listen to it, but certainly reading the transcript, um, that's certainly not what occurred here. Ms. Brazier was constantly interrupted right from the start um, of her submissions. And she was interrupted um, to the extent <coughs> that she felt <coughs> unable um, to properly and fairly put the mother's case. And the perception certainly left with the mother was that either the judge was biased against her, or she certainly appeared to be. It's also right to say, and, and my Lord, I, I will refer to the transcript in this regard, um, but none of the other um, were interrupted during the course of their closing submissions, um, certainly not to the level or extent that Miss Brazier was. Indeed, this <coughs> left the mother with the perception that the judge had already determined the case. and that the interruptions made um, were often um, to bolster that. Just so I'm absolutely clear, Ms. Rodriguez, at the time when Miss Brazier stood up, at that point, mm -hmm. the position was that two of the parties were asking for a care order, or proposing care order, the father and the guardian, yes. and two of the parties the local authority and your clan were proposing a supervision. <coughs> that, that's my understanding, my lord, yes. 
Um, and, and my Lord will see that the judgment provides for there to be an amended care order yeah. following that judgment. <coughs> I'm not sure there was one, but that was certainly... Um, amended care plan. Sorry, amended care plan, plan I'm sorry, yes. um, was to have followed the judgment. I'm not sure one did, but that was certainly how matters were left. Uh, um, my Lord, with regard to the um, transcript itself, um, my Lord will see that, um, again, from 612 onwards, um, there were constant interruptions, almost after everything that Miss Brazier said. Um, in addition to that, at the bottom of page 616, um, going over to the top, of page 617, Miss um, Granger attempts to address the learning judge um, in respect of the evidence given by Dr. Banks, the um, consultant psychologist. Um, and the response that the judge gives at the bottom of page 616 is, um, is that Miss Granger is effectively, she stopped mid sentence. <laughs> um, and the judge almost admonishes her for criticising um, Dr Banks uh, and the judge goes on to say, amongst other things, um, that um, um, he hasn't changed his view, etc. He's been firm from the beginning. The point that Ms Brazen was trying to make, among other points, was that his report uh, was quite was a, a year or so old at the time of the <coughs> hearing. But she didn't get an opportunity to advance or develop that submission. Um, she was effectively um, curtailed, um, and the point was made that he had chaired a professionals meeting, he had read all the up-to-date <coughs> documents, and therefore um, that certainly, that submission wasn't able to be developed. Forgive me for interrupting you again. And I ought to be clear about this, and I'm sorry that I'm not. Were there written submissions in this case, as well as the oral submissions? No, I don't Are the councillors so. shaking their heads? So I, 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 the impression I got was there weren't. So, thank you. I don't think there were, my no. no. Thank you. Um, so, this was, so this wasn't a case, then, of the judge anticipating what Miss Brazier was going to say. Oh, no because it was there on paper. No, no. She was um, making her submissions orally. Yes. My Lord will see um, at page 618 of the bundle, um, again, constant interruption. Um, and when <coughs> Fraser attempts to advance submissions um, on behalf of the mother, and she's told not to deviate from the point that the learned judge uh, wanted to deal with. Now, of course, it's perfectly open um, for a judge um, to request clarification or, or request that counsel address a certain point, um, but Ms. Brazier wasn't permitted to freely make submissions on behalf of the mother. She was effectively cornered into responding to this matter alone. Uh, and when she attempted to expand on her submissions, um, she was told not to deviate and, and therefore was left in no uncertain terms um, that she had to address that point and that point alone. I think, my Lord, just to take us back, there was also, I think it was at, at page 616, um, whereby um, in the course of her submissions, um, Miss Brazier says, amongst other things, that the matter was to the mother's credit. Uh, and the judge interrupts and says, um, effectively, no, it wasn't. Now, of course, that may well be the learned judge's perception, um, but it left Miss Brazier in a position. Uh, whereby her submissions were being shut down um, before she'd even made them or while she was making them. 614, the credit I, point. I do apologise, I'm grateful. 
Um, but the same occurs at page 620 um, of the bundle. I say that, it, it, it's quite prevalent in the interruptions. Um, but again, there's an example here of where um, Ms. Bravia uh, wasn't able to develop the point that she sought to on behalf of the mother. Uh, this led, of course, Ms. Brazier at 624, page 624 of the bundle, to say um, that um, she felt she was being grilled. Now, first of all, of course, this did not instill confidence in the mother who was sitting behind her counsel, um, who clearly made the point that she felt that she was being grilled and wasn't able to freely make submissions. Um, and this was something that... 623. Page 623. It wasn't 623. So, so sorry, Certainly in our copy. Pagination. <laughs> Don't worry. Internal 85. I'm grateful. Thank you. This was something that was only said um, and only related to Ms. Brazier. Uh, and it's all very well to suggest that other <coughs> counsel uh, were interrupted during the course of their closing submissions. It certainly wasn't um, in this manner. Um, and certainly none of the other counsel expressed, as Miss Brazier did, um, that she felt grilled and, and didn't feel able to fully develop um, her submission. Well, it's worse than that. Um because if one actually looks further back up that page, that the, the, the um, <coughs> council was forced into an apology which she didn't need to make uh, because she was trying to develop a submission uh, about the um, experience of the younger child and how that reflected well on the mother. Um, uh, and she started a sentence if the court could not see what has happened and then got ticked off. Uh, having heard the tape, she, she made that submission perfectly politely in a very neutral way. Uh, she was not being sarcastic or disrespectful in any respect. She gets the judge jumps down her throat. She's immediately forced into a, a, an apology. The judge then tries to interpret what counsel was saying um, before counsel's had a chance to develop it. And then she says, I don't mean any disrespect. I do feel slightly that I'm being grilled. So it's in that context, it's not only not being able to develop the submissions, but being told off for being disrespectful when she isn't. My lady, uh, my lady, as I say, I haven't had the chance to listen, so I, I, I wasn't able to ascertain the demeanour um, of what was said. But of course not, but it's bad across. enough when you look at it on the transcript. Yes, it certainly comes across. Uh, and, and the learned judge's response to that, as I recall, it is right. So uh, no doubt counsel felt even worse because um, uh, effective apology wasn't necessarily acknowledges, acknowledged or accepted. Mm -hmm. But of course, that leaves uh, the mother um, who sits, who sits <coughs> behind uh, Miss Brazier, um, certainly perceiving um, that her counsel is wrong, um, when indeed that's not necessarily the case. <coughs> um, she also perceives that her counsel um, submissions are undermined. Just on the, the topic of um, <coughs> whether counsel was wrong, um, <coughs> I, I say this so that other counsel have the opportunity to, to address it if, if they wish to, but, but speaking entirely for myself, but um, it, it, it appears also a view shared by my lady. When Miss Brazier said a few lines higher up the page, that the mother's position <coughs> she submits is strengthened by the comparator. W when the next sentence begins, if the court could not see what has happened, that uh, I, I, speaking for myself, expect the sentence to continue by <coughs> drawing either a parallel or a contrast be between what is it is said revealed by the, the comparison. Yeah. Clearly the judge took it an entirely different way and took it as an impertinent criticism of the court for being unable to see a, an obvious point. That, that seems to have been the judge's reaction. Indeed. 
So, um, <clears throat> so as I say, I, I make my understanding of that half sentence clear in case any other council wishes to address it at any point. Indeed, my lord. Um, <coughs> and of course, Ms. Brazier was there, thereafter stopped from pursuing that point. Well, she did her best to pick it up, in oh, yes. fairness. I mean, if one looks at 624, she she, um, she was actually allowed to get out um, a few sentences before the judge interrupted her again at the top of 624. Um, um, and then um, was um, interrupted again. So she did actually manage to get a, a few points out in relation to the children and the um, improvement in <laughs> the younger child's experience. My lady, yes, uh, um, Miss Brazier made a valiant effort to develop and address the submissions in full, mm. and to some extent she did, but to a large extent she wasn't able to <coughs> because of the constant interruptions mm. and, and indeed um, the manner uh, by which the court perceived um, some of the submissions that she made or certainly attempted um, to make. Um, but it boils down to the perception um, that she wasn't able to fairly put the mother's case. Um, and, and no doubt the mother certainly perceived that for some reason <coughs> the judge was against her. Um, my Lord, given um, the nature, the level and the extent of the interruptions and the comments made, um, the perception was that the judge had effectively prejudged or appeared um, to have prejudged the issues without hearing the submissions made. And <coughs> that colours um, the other grounds. <coughs> My Lord, I just. I seek now to go back to the grounds that I started at the end. Um, I'm not sure if your Lordships would like you to do that now or hear from the others with regard to the fifth <coughs> ground. I'm in the court's hands. Yes, it, it's... Um, it's I think probably most convenient since you're on your feet, if, if you stay on your feet, Ms. Ojadiku. But we, we have, as we've said, um, read all the uh, very helpful skeleton arguments on all sides, um, so that we, we know the arguments rel relating to the other grounds. But, but do, do by all means please go on to say w w the points you want to make about the other grounds. My Lord, I'm grateful. Of course, I won't uh, read them out or, no. or, or rehearse them in that regard. Um, but, my Lord, um, I seek to emphasise the context to this hearing because, of course, the context was that the care plan, the final care plan, um, in respect of D1 and D2 before the court, at the time of this hearing, uh, was for them <coughs> to remain in the care of their mother pursuant to supervision orders. That that was the context. Um, and it's right to say um, but particularly, for, first of all, with regard to the first ground, um, the learned <coughs> judge heard evidence from the allocated social worker who effectively spoke to that final care plan. Um, and the recommendations therein were finely balanced, but the local authority's care plan was for the children to remain with their mother pursuant to supervision orders in any event. Um, but the learned judge did not consider um, the nuances of the case in the context of the care plan that was before the court. My Lord, with regard to the second round, um, 
the issue of domestic violence um, between the parents of D1 and D2 uh, was somewhat significant. Um, and my Lord will see from the transcript um, that the learned judge made much of the fact um, that, as she put it, um, as the learned judge put it, the mother had effectively gone back um, to resume an abusive relationship. Um, and Miss Brazius tried her utmost best um, to pursue and develop submissions along the lines of that whilst the mother may have returned to that relationship, it wasn't a willful decision of hers. Um, it was as a result of the controlling and coercive behaviour um, of the father that led her to that situation. Um, but she was unable um, to address that certainly fairly, um, because the, the judge um, constantly referred to the fact that the mother had gone back. My Lord, I, I'll just find that. I think that's at the start of the... Um... It's early on in the submissions. Yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, uh, <clears throat> starts at the bottom of 613. Okay, great. Um, and... <clears throat> um, the judge's comment, first comment, is at the top of 614. I'm very grateful, my lord. And that point is pursued, <coughs> and the judge keeps coming back to the fact that the mother went back <coughs> to the relationship yeah. without properly considering the submissions made by Miss Brazier. Um, but it was as a result of the father's conduct as opposed to the mother's. Uh, my Lord, with regard to um, the third ground, um, the judge failed to conduct a clear and proper analysis of the factors set out in the welfare checklist, uh, in particular the impact upon the children of a change in circumstances. Now, these were children that had always been together, um, and as far as I'm aware, there wasn't a sibling assessment um, in the bundle. And yet, um, the judge readily um, made care orders without, given, without giving any or, or any sufficient consideration to the impact um, on the children, not only, of course, of being separated from each other, but also um, from being separated from their baby sibling, who by all of this, <coughs> they, they had a good relationship with. In her judgment, she does refer briefly to the children's wishes, doesn't she? I think. My Lord, I think that's right, but not the impact um, on Your them. point is, she doesn't refer to the different factor in the welfare checklist, the impact of any change of circumstances. Indeed, indeed. And of course... Paragraph, yes. forgive me, it's paragraph 28. <coughs> And <clears throat> and at twenty nine, the the judge said that because the uh, <clears throat> because the the daughter is accustomed to see a, a lot of her grandmother at weekends. The children were therefore familiar with being apart from one another. Indeed, my lord, but that is not um, a, a consideration of the impact. It's, it, it's, there's no, no analysis uh, in respect of the impact on the children of being separated no. from each other and, of course, their siblings. Just, um, <coughs> whilst I have interrupted you, <laughs> I'll, I'll continue to interrupt, if, if, if I may, with apologies. You, you've, you've made the point in your submissions that the end product <coughs> of the judgment was an order that care orders be made uh, without any care plan being in place. So this wasn't a, a case of the Guardian saying, for example, well, it's finally balanced between plan A and plan B. 
and I'd like to listen to the evidence before I decide finally which of those plans is, is best for the children. Yeah. <coughs> uh, the, the, the only plan for consideration was the supervision order plan, if I can use that shorthand term. Uh, and when the judge decided that she would not approve that and make care orders, it, it was then left on the basis that the local authority would sort out a, an amended care plan. Now, d just help me, please, if you would, with, with the practicalities of, of that. D to take um, one obvious example relevant to the submissions you're making, as at that stage, am I right in thinking no one in the court would know whether the eventual plan would involve the children being separated from one another. My Lord, that's my understanding, because there was no care plan no. Um, for a care order before. And, and what, um, what, what sort of geography could hypothetically be involved? Are we talking only about a placement within a particular borough or within somewhere in Greater London or, or anywhere in the country? My Lord, may I turn my back? Mm. I'm not sure in that regard. I don't think... <coughs> may I turn my back? Yes, of course. Uh, my Lord, as I understand it, and there was no particular geography as to where the placements would be, um, yeah. So there was nothing to suggest that they would both be placed in the same vicinity um, of where they lived right. or anything like that. Um, I, my instructions are that shortly after the hearing, a prospective placement is found for the male, D2. Um, but as I understand it, um, it wasn't suitable. Right. So, so as things stood at the end of the hearing, the, 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 the judge had earlier made plain that she didn't feel it necessary to um, consider the position of any of the grandparents in great detail because none of them were seeking to be full-time carers. But amongst the other potential consequences of the, <coughs> the, the way the judge made her decision, if I correctly understood, one consequence might be that one or both children could end up um, <coughs> geographically far removed from one or more of the grandparents. My Lord, that's my understanding, because there was no stipulation. Um, mm. No guarantee that D1 would be anywhere near the grandmother with whom she'd been accustomed to spend her weekend. That's how I understand it, my Lord. All right. Well, thank you. Presumably, <coughs> the question would arise as to <coughs> schooling, and after the progress that uh, the, the boy had made, I assume it was the plan for the, him to continue at that school. So the foster placement for him would have to have been in a, in a location where that was feasible. I assume. Well, Lord, we I we don't have, this is the sort of thing that yes. would be covered in a plan. I can take instructions, but I, I, that's my assumption, because there, there was no evidence before the court as to um, where the school or the proposed school would be. No. But the, 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 that's the sort of detail that... Uh, might be in a plan the child will be placed in a foster placement in a location that will be enable him to continue to attend the school where he has made progress. That's the sort of thing you would yes. you would expect to see in a plan. Yes, but that was lacking, of course, my lord, because there was no care. No, no. Well, that was one of the that points way. that Miss Brazy was valiantly trying to get across to the judge yes. because when she was talking about the boy and the progress that he'd made. Um, one of the concerns was that um, assessments that were necessary to um, consider uh, the child's educational needs, um, bearing in mind the potential uh, diagnosis that he was subject to, yes. um, could be interrupted by um, moving him into foster care. Uh, and the judge rather poo-pooed that um, as, uh, 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 by saying it was all pure speculation and therefore she wasn't going to engage with it. Indeed, my lady. So really, this was a case, was it, where the, su the submissions part of the hearing was pretty important. I mean, of course, submissions were always important, yeah. but we know that um, 
some cases where their, the oral submissions process may be less important than others if there are written submissions and the, as it were, tram lines of the case are clear from the outset. The oral submissions may be less important. They're still important, but may be less important. Here, there were no written submissions. Yeah. And the comparison that was having to be made between the care order option and the supervision order option, with two parties lining up on each side, required careful analysis and consideration. My Lord, indeed, the submissions were even more important in this case than perhaps others, given the context of the care plan that yeah. was before the court and the evidence. Well, between us, we've comprehensively interrupted you, Ms. Ojudiku. Yes. Okay. So if, if you can find your way back to, to where you'd got to in your notes. I was just about to ask if I can assist the court further. Um, uh, you, with you, to you don't, we interrupted you in the middle of ground three, oh, so okay. I think perhaps you haven't addressed ground four. Oh, I'm grateful. Yes, I'm, thank you very much. Um, the judge failed to identify that there were gaps in the evidence and in doing so failed to consider properly, or at all, what information would <coughs> be required to plug such gaps. And um, my Lord will see that this is a case whereby, um, first of all, a lot of the evidence uh, was somewhat old. Um, Dr Banks' report um, was a year old. Um, and there was some further evidence that was outstanding at the time of the contested hearing, um, including, among other things, um, the outcome of D2's ADHD assessment um, and D1's EHCP application. Now, it, it may be said that that evidence wasn't relevant to the matters before the court, but of course, given the fact that the care plan endorsed by the learned judge was for a care order, um, D2's ADHD assessment was important because, of course, it was important to ensure um, that he was placed in an appropriate placement where his needs would be met. That, of course, may have entailed specialist carers, um, provisions for contact, um, should have been properly considered um, and amongst other things the issue of separating um, the siblings was something that could and should also have been considered and that would have been informed um, by the said assessments that may have commented on the sibling relationship and, and, and how beneficial <coughs> that was to um, D2 given his um, prospective diagnosis um, as I alluded to earlier on, my Lord, there was also, of course, the outstanding <coughs> evidence from the family support workers, um, which the learned judge declined to read. There was some evidence from the family support workers before the court, but the judge declined to read it. Um, and the point that Ms. Brazier um, was trying to um, make in that regard was the progress that the mother had made, the recent um, and long-term pro progress that she had made but would have been apparent um, from the family support worker who was visiting the home on a very regular basis. My Lord, in considering um, this ground, I, again I've started from the bottom, um, but of course page nine of the skeleton argument, um, a fundamental piece of evidence that was lacking was a care plan um, for there to be a placement of the children in foster care. And further inquiries of the wider family members in the light um, of the change in care plans and indeed further inquiries of the children's school. schools. Um, in the judgment um, 
my lords will see um, that there was no attempt um, to plug those gaps. And yet they were fundamental, um, given the context and the changing care plan. Thank you very much indeed. I'm very grateful. Yes. My Lords, on behalf of the uh, local authority, perhaps I could just deal with the point raised in relation to the uh, final care plans and the like. Uh, the position was in the uh, final care plans, a local authority's first stance, of course, was supervision order, children to remain with mother. But the alternative care plan, run in parallel, as it were, maybe perhaps anticipating that Her Honour was not going to endorse the care plan from the local authority, uh, was that uh, if a care order were made, then the option of the children was going to be long-term fostering. So that was the position from the outset, uh, a parallel, if you like, <laughs> care plan, which was known to all parties. Uh, when it became apparent that um, Her Honour was not with the local authority in relation to, if I can refer to it as limb one of the care plan in relation to supervision. Uh, instructions were taken and the position was rather than apply to adjourn as it were to finalise uh, further care plan in relation to that, uh, we simply adopted as it were the parallel uh, care plan, uh, care order uh, and fostering, long term fostering for the children. Uh, and I, I know your Lordships have raised a concern uh, in relation to this, in relation to the boy, uh, D2, shortly after the hearing, a placement had been found for him, uh, suitable foster care, a long-term foster care, uh, and uh, D2 would have been able to stay at his school and the excellent progress that he'd been making, uh, credit to his mother, maybe in relation to that, would have been able to continue. So that was the position uh, in relation to the local authority stance in relation to the care plan. So, um, I'm, I'm so sorry. Yes. Um, I, I got slightly lost. You say that the, the, the proposed alternative care plan would necessarily involve a placement of at least the boy somewhere close to his Yes, his yes. We managed to secure quite quickly a placement for D2. But, but, sorry, when, when, when did you manage to secure that? It was very shortly after, my lord. Might I just turn my back for a moment? Thank you. I'm, remind I'm very grateful for my lord friend. It was on the evening before uh, the judgment in anticipation uh, of what might happen uh, when Her Honour made her determination. So just to clarify, um, there was no placement of, uh, that was known to all the parties at the hearing. No. It was only when you saw the way that the wind was blowing, I don't mean that pejoratively, no. that you um, uh, managed to happen yes. that you managed serendipitously yes. to find a suitable placement for the younger child. That's correct. Which right. would have meant that uh, <coughs> he at least was accommodated yes. um, uh, in a satisfactory way. That's correct, my lady. So when you say that there was a sort of limb two or a fallback limb, there was nothing fleshed out. There was nothing no. tangential. Uh, there, there, there was nothing with any sort of substance no. to it. Oh, it was right. just well, if you don't accept our our primary position, yes. this is the fallback that yes, we have then to we have down. to make provision <laughs> yes. in relation to uh, the judgment which Her Honour, uh, Your Lordship, no made. So that was the position uh, in relation to the local authority uh, stand. Mr. Uh, Collins, yes. please forgive me for interrupting you again. I know it's difficult. 
It's always difficult being interrupted by a yes. judge, particularly when there are three judges, so I do apologise. I don't think we've got the care plan. Have we actually in the, the care plan I, I that was before the judge at the right start of the law. hearing? We haven't got it in our bundles. I don't believe it is my bundle. It, it wasn't included, I don't think, in the final no, index. Well, so I should have had, when giving now. permission to Colin, I should have asked for it, and I'm sorry. Mm. Um, when you say, you mentioned the alternative plan. Yes. Did the care plan itself, and we'll see, we'd be grateful if you, I, for my part, I'd like to see it. Right. Did it say, alternatively? Yes. So there were, the alternatives yes, were did. in the plan? Definitely. Right. Okay. So it was, as it were, a dual purpose, if I can yes. use that phraseology, and if all scenario, okay. taking into account but what may happen. But it wasn't in, to... it wasn't obviously fully fleshed out. No. Because the judge asked you, I think the only point at which the judge interrupted any of the submissions, apart from Miss Grazier's, yes. was when she asked you, and if I'm against you, um, yes. uh, what about the yes. care plan or, or something like that? I, I, I think that's right, right. Lord, in relation So there was a fleshing out that needed to be done. Yes. You used an interesting phrase, Mr. Collins, when you were introducing this. <laughs> Unintentionally, my Well, let's see. You said that, you said that the locals already had the, the, the two plans, as it were. Yes. And you said, when it became apparent that the judge was not mm. with us on the main yes. plan. And I can't resist asking you, Mr. Uh, Collins, when when do you say that was? was? When at the end of the judgment, when the carol at the end of the judgment was made. Yes, I had taken instructions in anticipation. Uh, can I put it this way? Seeing how the wind was blowing uh, as to what may happen, so that was why we were ready to go, as it were, as soon as the judge made her decision in relation <coughs> to final carol. Um, my lords, if I may move on to. Um, dealing with matters in the same way as my learned friend did. Uh, the question of Her Honour's uh, interruptions. I, I think one has to look at this case, as it were, in the round uh, and in context. Her Honour had a very pragmatic view, I think, in relation to case management of the case, be it in relation to uh, time constraints, uh, questions that were being asked, evidence uh, and the like. Um, one of her robust responses, I think, in relation to uh, an application to plug the gaps that the Malona Trent has mentioned, is that, of course, this case had been going on for a very long time. And Her Honour, I think, expressed dismay that the other solicitors, maybe, had not got their house in order in relation to that evidence. And again, I think one reading the transcript um, gets a flavour her Honour's pragmatic stance in relation to case management of the case. Uh, coming back to the interruptions, I think it was, it was evident uh, throughout the case, the hearing, that Her Honour was very um, clued up, really, in relation to what were the relevant issues in the case. Uh, perhaps an example of that was her curtailment of uh, mother's cross-examination father in relation to his um, behaviour uh, at various contact visits. Right to say there were occasions when father became very animated uh, about what was happening in relation to the children. Her Honour took a pragmatic view in relation to that, but that was not going to assist her uh, in the final determination uh, of what was in the interests of the welfare of these children. So that is an example W w w why then did it assist her for Mr. Schmidt to cross-examine for 100 pages of the transcript? I know not the answer to that, my lord. I don't know. I, I don't think it was all in relation to uh, the contact. Uh, the no. In, in so far as much of it was not Mr. Schmidt, but the judge. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there again we have an example of a wrong, I think, a pragmatic approach to, to case management and questioning she felt um, in her mind not assisting her. Um, but again, forgive me, I know it's difficult when there were three of us. Yes, <laughs> even no. more difficult. The, the, mother, the mother's case, as Miss Odudiku has reminded us, was, Miss Brazier's case was, mm. on behalf of the mother, that 
in assessing the issue of domestic abuse, yes. you had to take into account what the mother said was coercive control, Right. I'm using labels of course, by the father. So the issue of exactly how to interpret the domestic abuse and what weight to attach to mm. the whole issue about it was in the forefront of the mother's case. Yes. So isn't that the context in which we have to consider whether it was fair to curtail the cross-examination of the father about the abuse? Um, my Lord, on, on reflection, uh, I suppose the answer to that has to be yes. Uh, but uh, as I say, our honour, as my Lords know, is a very pragmatic view uh, in relation uh, to that. I, <coughs> the argument gets no better over repetition, I have mm. to say. And the, 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 the difficulty, if I may suggest it, course. Mr. Collins, m may be that in some cases, of course, it's possible to say this line of questioning or submissions relates to a matter which is not an issue before the court. Yes. It's therefore irrelevant, and the court shouldn't be um, wasting its time mm. in hearing anything about it. It's simply not an issue in the right. case. But here, perhaps, it's rather harder to draw those bright lines yes. when, as my Lord has just pointed out um, on this particular topic, the mother's case for the judge to consider is, before you condemn me for, in the judge's phrase, running back to him, yes. um, it's only fair to hear what I have to say about controlling and coercive behaviour, right. to use the label again. Yes, and, and perhaps the difficulty for any judge in terms of conducting a, a, a trial it is to, to find the happy medium yes. between uh, focusing on the, the issues which are yes. going to help the judge without uh, suggesting that there's been a degree of predetermination mm. um, of what <coughs> is going to uh, assist the judge in the sense of supporting a uh, Conclusion. Yes, uh, your lordships, of course, have the benefit of the full transcript in relation to well, this. Well, we do. And <laughs> you see, I think, the way Her Honour's mind was working. I, I just think, the, uh, as, as I recall, the curtailment of cross examination by Miss Brazier, as I say, was in relation to father's conduct at, at contact centres where the children were present, not in relation to anything to do with mother. And I think that was why. Okay. Her Honour felt that she could curtail that line of cross-examination uh, and did so in accordance with her uh, case management uh, powers. Um, the uh, position in, in relation to the, her comments about the domestic violence, uh, I, I know my learned friend has put forward, as it were, a mother's take on that. But on the other hand, it was a, it was a global assessment, I think, Her Honour indicating that she was aware of this very familiar pattern in these very difficult uh, relationships. So more of an en passant, if you like, comment on, on what was happening. Um, and again, I think in the context as a whole, uh, our honour, of course, would have the benefit <coughs> of seeing mother and father uh, give evidence, and, and, and that may, to a certain extent, have affected uh, the way her honour chose, uh, as it were, to try and <coughs> glean further information that will be of assistance to her uh, by way of uh, the interruptions during the course of the closing speech. Uh, so it's the local authorities' case, as my lords know, that looking at this from the outside, <coughs> an onlooker, I, I appreciate we're looking at mother's perception, would not perceive that the case was biased or that the judge had predetermined uh, any of the issues which she needed, uh, as it were, uh, to determine. Uh, at the end of the uh, proceeding. Uh, my Lord, I've, I've set out uh, in the skeleton argument how we respond to the other grounds uh, in relation to the appeal. Uh, the plugging of the evidence, I, I think, that I, I dealt with. Uh, the judge, just bear with me for a moment, my Lord. Um, in relation to the weight to be attached to the evidence, that, of course, is, we say, entirely a matter for the judge, uh, having had the benefit of seeing and hearing all of the witnesses, Dr. Banks, mother, father, uh, and the guardian, uh, give
give evidence. So the weight attached to there, a matter for her honour, as it were, being uh, hands-on in relation uh, to the evidence. Um, aspects of the mother's case, as I said, the, the judge dealt with that in a way uh, by indicating that um, given the <coughs> stage of proceeding, she would have expected, uh, as it were, that evidence uh, if it were there. And we see from the evidence that mother seeks to produce now uh, that some of that, of course, would have been uh, available at the time. Um, failing to conduct a fair and proper analysis of the facts set out in the welfare checklist, I think from Her Honour's very succinct judgment, it's obvious that she had all of those factors in mind, albeit it has to be said that she didn't, of course, work her way uh, through the list, setting out the pros and cons of each. There isn't, although my Lord has mentioned, of course, there was uh, a mention to separation of the children. Uh, it's not dealt with uh, specifically, although dealt with, if you like, holistically during the course uh, of the judgment. Um, How do you square uh, the um, absence in the judgment of any dealing of the uh, potential segregation of the children from the wider family as well as from each other? Um, as being something in the obviously in the judge's mind, with the fact that she stopped Miss Brazier from even addressing her on the question of the right. grandparents. It's a very difficult squaring exercise, my lady, mm. in relation to that. Um, we have a very experienced uh, family judge dealing with her. From the outset, the case had been described as um, a very finely balanced exercise. And I think her honour had grasped the nettle uh, in relation to that. And as I say, just very succinctly dealt with all of those matters. Uh, I dare say, on reflection with hindsight, it may have been a better exercise to work through individually the welfare checklist. But we have, as I say, uh, an experienced judge dealing with the matter very pragmatically. Um, I don't know if that squares the matter, my lady, but it's an attempt to do so. Um, those are my submissions on behalf of, of the local authority in response, unless I can assist my lords any further. Mm -hmm. Can you just help me, please, yes. Mr. Collins, with um, one factual aspect, really? Right. Um, you were uh, on your feet at the very start of the case, mm. um, page 180 in the bundle, page 2 of the transcript. Um, <clears throat> You mentioned that the Guardian had recently provided an indication that she wanted to hear the evidence and make a decision. Yes. To which the judge says, well, get on with the evidence. Um, you tentatively suggested that somebody might be asking for more time. Yes. And there was then a reference by the judge to not being party to a decision that it starts in the afternoon. I'd, I'd, I'd be very grateful to just get straight in my own mind. Right. That there had been put in place, had there, uh, either by agreement or by order, a, a specific timetable of the proceedings. Yes. My Lord, I think at the IRH before, which I wasn't present at, it was agreed that the case would start at 10 o'clock. And I think the confusion arose because there was a witness template subsequently circulated which indicated that day one, morning, would be at reading time. And I know that Miss Brazier came into the case late, and I think it was on the witness template that she was relying, rather than the order from the uh, IRH money. Right. So that was how things stood until something like six o'clock on the Friday before the hearing. I think it's five past six. Five past six. <laughs> Very good. Um, when I gather there was an email, yes. but I haven't seen it. What, what, what did the email from the judge's my, part My say? recollection, I'll be corrected, it was from... Her Honour, I think, saying that the case was going to start at 10 o'clock on the Monday. Yes, but, but did, did the judge say, and evidence will be called at, at one minute past 10? Uh, did she simply say, it, I, I want you all there? It certainly didn't make reference to the entire morning being given to reading time, that's for sure. I think it read as the case was going to start at 10 o'clock, and then that was Her Honour's stance on, on day one, of course. This case is going to start at 10 o'clock. Yes, but, but there's a difference, isn't there, mm. between saying on the one hand, I want you all there, Yes. don't, don't be turning up at two o'clock, I want everyone mm. there mm. to be getting on with anything that needs getting on with. Yes. 
uh, and saying, I want the evidence to start right. at Well, 10 my understanding was the evidence was going to start at 10 o'clock, hence Miss Brazier's tentative application to adjourn to later in the day so that she could take instructions, because I think that was the first time that she'd met Mother. Mm. So the IRH said it would start at 10. Yes. Then the, the witness template, so yes. counsel between you yes. agreed. Yes. Um, that it would start yes. with a morning's reading. Yes. And I don't know when Her Honour became the allegated judge, but I presume that she saw the witness template and then decided to notify all parties that despite of that, we were going to start at 10 o'clock. And that was an email at five past six, was it? Yes, on the Friday. Right. Thank you. Well, that's, that's very helpful. Clarification. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Yes, Mr. Schmidt. My Lord, my Lady. Um, you have my skeleton, my lord, and uh, father also endorses the skeleton of the children's guardian. Um, in terms of just picking up on those uh, points, it might be helpful to look at the order um, of the IR uh, of the PTR pretrial review on the fifteenth of February, twenty twenty-three, before Her Honour Judge Satnara. That's at page seven hundred and seventeen of and. Um, that will provide some context as to what was going on um, in the uh, four weeks or so before the final hearing. Um, specifically to assist you, uh, my lord, on the issue of the care plan, um, you will see um, that paragraph one of the order, the local authority was ordered to serve an updated care plan to deal precisely with the issue that um, has been identified effectively that um, the local authority had conducted the case on the basis that it was proceeding to a supervision order for 12 months with this mother and had no parallel plan uh, in place. Um, the, the background to that is an IRH which was um, a long time previously, the issues resolution hearing was on the 9th of September 2022, that was for Her Honour Judge Harris. Again, there was really no judicial continuity mm. at all in these proceedings. No. Uh, on that occasion, I, I should say I didn't appear on that occasion or at the uh, pre-trial review, but from reading the recital and speaking to my instructor sister, who did represent uh, the, the father on that occasion, it was at the RH stage, it was only the father who was saying, I, I contest the, the care plan for supervision. Mm. And by looking at those recitals, he was encouraged to perhaps reconsider his position given that there seemed to be an overwhelming weight of professional opinion that this matter was suitable, suitable to be disposed of by way of supervision. Uh, he considered that and he maintained his position uh, that there should be um, a contest, if I can put it that way, that he did not agree the local authority plan. And uh, from there, the, 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 the proceedings evolved because there was a new children's guardian appointed, Ms. Peters, uh, who did not share the previous guardian's enthusiasm for simply continuing with supervision for this family. Um, and by the time you reach the pre-trial review, I say perhaps just three weeks before the final hearing, it's very clear there is a contest here, uh, and therefore there needs to be a parallel plan in place. And that order leads to uh, the generation of, a, of, a, of an amended care plan, which uh, regretfully is not for your lordships and your ladyship, which uh, does um, effectively set out that in the alternative there is a plan for long-term foster placement for these children. Uh, and my learned friend from the Guardian showed me that. I hope she can provide that to, uh, to the court. Um, and I agree with what Mr. Collins says, the local authority it doesn't go into any particular detail. There were significant practical issues with the placement of these children, given uh, firstly their age, uh, and secondly, um, their well-documented behavioural and educational needs, um, providing finding a foster placement for both children to be placed together was likely to be um, challenging. Uh, and in the event, as you've heard, the local authority were able to find a placement very quickly, but it was simply for the son. Uh, it didn't include the daughter, so it would have involved separation of the siblings. Uh, and... Uh, as I understand it, we're no further on with that, <coughs> that search uh, as of today. So um, it's right to say that parallel planning was missing uh, from the local authority's approach, and it was something that was pressure was applied 
fairly late in the day of the pre-trial review to try and rectify that position. Um, so there wasn't this huge amount of information available on that. Uh, and, and I would agree with the observations that didn't form a particularly <coughs> striking part of, it, of, the, of the judgment uh, or the submissions. That issue of sibling separation and the impact of that on the children, it, it, it was put by me quite early on in proceedings to the social worker that foster placement would be a safer place for these children. And actually, the judge interrupts me on that occasion and says, well, there's no guarantee that the foster placement wouldn't break down anyway. Um, and in the Guardian's um, analysis before the final hearing, where she, where she reserves her position, she also makes the point that, that the daughter may simply vote with her feet if she's placed somewhere other than with the mother. So these issues are, are there um, uh, in evidence um, as factors that are relevant to final deter determination. Um, so that, that's what I would say about... Um, about the fact that we had a, a, um, a care plan, I think it proceeded for, for many months on the basis of sort of an air of inevitability about how these, how these proceedings would be disposed of by way of supervision. By the time we get to the final hearing, um, it's, it's changed fairly drastically in the sense that we've now got a guardian reserving her position and actually, if you, if you read between the lines, saying she's got very significant concerns about this mother and the care. Um, and you've got a local authority. Forgive me interrupting, Mr. Smith, but um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not really following this. Because you're, you're, you're indicating that there were really two alternatives flagged up at, at, at any rate within a week or so of the, the <coughs> preliminary hearing to which you invited our attention. But on the one hand, you had what had been the <coughs> plan favoured by everyone except father, which was a detailed plan. And on the other hand, you had a plan to make a plan. And uh, speaking for myself, I just wonder, how is anybody to, uh, to address that? How, how is anybody to work out where the best interests of the children lie, when on the one hand, you've got a detailed plan to which objection is taken, and on the other hand, you've got uh, what, what, what seems to be the proposition, well, care orders should be made and, and, and then we'll see what we can do. But from, from the father's point of view, how, how, how was he to uh, uh, address that? If, for example, this uh, as yet unexplored care plan might involve the children not only being separated from one another, but both ending up miles and miles from him, so that visiting them or seeing them was very, very difficult. So, so f forgive me if I'm missing something, but I just don't really understand how the parties can address in evidence and argument competing plans when only one of them is a plan and the other is a plan to make a plan. Yes, my Lord, I agree. I, I wasn't making that. I was making an observation to try and assist the court with yes, the context of what's going on. My instructions were <coughs> that the father wanted the children removed from the mother and, if necessary, separated, if that was the only way it could be facilitated. Right. And that so was, he didn't mind where they went. As long that as was, they were, a, that was the overriding, overriding uh, right. force of his instruction, uh, and that desire for that to be affected uh, was uh, is the guiding um, force of, of his uh, position and my, and my submissions. Um, the um, domestic violence issue, um, my lord, um, I don't in any way seek to um, apply any gloss to the passage that. Uh, your Lord uh, my, uh, and your Lord, uh, my lady, has already been to speak for itself. But in terms of the domestic abuse itself within the case, it was historical in nature. The mother's case was that they'd separated for three years, and I would just draw your, your Lord's attention to the, the threshold document that was specifically agreed by the mother at the IRH. The domestic violence history is expressed neutrally within that document. There's no finding sort or any particular apportionment as between father and mother and um, when Ms. Brazier did, um, did seek to, to ask questions she was told it wouldn't assist her but within the judgment at 509 she does within, within the transcript of 509 she is actually permitted to go on and ask some questions about it and within the judgment uh, of uh, one of Judge Hughes AC the father is is criticised for his role in the domestic violence briefly. Um, 
page 152 of the bundle, and the mother is given some credit uh, for having extracted herself from uh, domestic violence issues at paragraph 19D, Roman numeral 2 of Honours Judgment Transcript, page 150. Um, just to clarify as well, so that the Lord has the full understanding of the, what happened with the closing submissions, it's probably the aspect of my skeleton that, that's touched on least, and in fact, it's interesting, um, the Lord trips the most. Um, just so you have the, the, the sake of clarity, um, you had the, the Guardian give evidence in chief at 4.14pm on the 8th of March, according to the transcript. So she was giving her recommendations already to the court. Um, the um, recommendation was for care orders with removal. She returned in the morning and she was cross-examined at 11am. That was the, the gap. And my closing submissions began at 3.15pm later that day, which were about 35 minutes. Uh, and my lawyer wasn't interrupted uh, once. Um, the uh, professional evidence, the context of that was with Stevens having given um, evidence that she didn't see the mother could care safely for the children. And Dr. Banks's evidence was that no support could be given to the children because the mother would undermine it. And the local authority had called Miss Stevens as their witness and had called Dr. Banks as their witness and at no point challenged the, con the content of that evidence within um, uh, their case. And indeed, they'd relied on the final threshold, which I've taken your lordship to, and um, that included mother's lack of engagement with support services and the damning opinion <coughs> of um, Dr. Banks. So within that context, it's, it's the submission from, from me that um, the judge's interruptions were, were, were focused on the merits of the mother's case or her perceived uh, merits of the mother's case um, or perhaps more accurately on the lack of merits of the case so that's that's the submission I make on that. Are you submitting but that makes it any better? I'm submitting that it, it, it's not a case where she prejudged the outcome uh, my lady simply uh, that she was engaging as she did throughout the hearing in a very interventionist style my lady she took over my uh, cross-examination for large periods of it um, uh, with a mixture of some open questions at the time to very close questions um, and it was clear I think in the, in, the, in the journey that takes place when you read the transcript at the beginning of the hearing she's correcting me in, in my questions and, and, give, and, and assisting the social worker by the end of the hearing she's uh, obviously making a very interventionist stance in the closing submission to uh, my learned friend and I as I say as a teacher Entirely glossed to that, but just the submission that she was, she probably had formed a strong view over the course of my closing submissions that had just taken place previously. The Guardian's evidence that had taken place the afternoon before, within that context, she was combative uh, and interventionist with what the mother was trying to express through her counsel. My lord, I can't. I don't think I can assist further than, than that. If I can assist on a particular point. No, thank you very much, Mr. Schmidt. Yes, Miss Cheetham. Thank you, my lord. Um, I know that you have had a rather lengthy document from me already, and I won't seek to uh, repeat anything that is uh, contained within <coughs> that. It was probably longer than it should have been, so I apologise that um, I, I uh, went on for too long during it. Um, in terms of the uh, grounds, um, I started with ground E because I could see um, that that was the ground with the greatest merit. And um, frankly, if that ground failed in my submission, the others um, couldn't stand alone. That was um, certainly my view of the um, five grounds of appeal that were before the court. Um, and ground E3 is undoubtedly the strongest of those grounds. Uh, but just generally in relation to uh, Ground E, um, I make the point within my written document um, that the judge was uh, exercising the overriding <coughs> objective of the uh, family procedure rules. Um, I accept that she did so um, in a uh, robust and interventionist way um, 
those of us who are familiar with um, Her Honour Judge Hughes Casey, and I hope she'll forgive me for saying this, <coughs> know that that is the way in which she approaches cases. Um, she doesn't like to waste time. Um, she likes to get on with the evidence. Um, and I have to say, for my part, as soon as I knew that she was our, going to be our trial judge, I was uh, ready for us to start very promptly on the Monday morning, because I know that that is her pattern, for example, and uh, that uh, one does need to stand one's ground um, in court uh, when before Her Honour Judge Hughes, because um, she, she engages very much with hearing and with with hearings and with advocates, um, and that is her style as a judge, and obviously there is a wide ambit that is permitted to trial judge, judges in order for hearings to be effective. Can I just check this? The witness template had provided for a reading morning. Is that right? It had, um, but that was an error, um, well, because... Uh, go on. <laughs> um, I had been at the hearing on the 15th, of February before Her Honour Judge Satnara. I don't think any of the ad other advocates had been, um, but Her Honour Judge Satnara was very clear um, that uh, the uh, hearing itself, uh, not just discussions, but the hearing itself would start at 10 o'clock. Um, I think she said in terms that uh, hearing times for, uh, for the court were um, 10 o'clock, until uh, four o'clock and I commented on the different approaches taken by some judges at, for example, the Central Family Court uh, because some judges acknowledge that they have a lot of short hearings first thing in the morning and that the hearing day should run for a trial from 11 until uh, four so that they have time to deal with short hearings in the morning. She was very clear um, and uh, robust herself in that. Judge Judge Sapnar. Yes, she was. Yes, she okay. was very clear that we would start the evidence and we should uh, make sure that the witness template reflected that. When I came to... Sorry, my lord. Right. Carry on. Uh, well, when I came to see the witness template, I maybe anticipate your question, um, <coughs> and discussed it at the advocates' meeting, um, my recollection, I'm sure I'll be told if I'm wrong about this, was that um, I reminded the parties um, that of, of what Her Honour Judge Sapnara had said and that there was going to be a revised witness template to reflect Her Honour Judge Satnara's views. I don't think we ever saw that. Um, was Miss Bra when was Miss Brazier instructed? She was at the advocates' meeting. I think it was on the Thursday of that week. Again, I'll be correct if I'm wrong. Um, her solicitor represented the mother at the hearing on the 15th of February. Right. So it's for that reason that I say that that's not a valid criticism and that the mother's team should have been ready to start on the Monday morning. Well, yes. And Miss Brazier, this was <coughs> Thursday yes. evening? Thursday evening for the advocates' meeting. Yes. yes. So at that point, that was the first inkling is this fair, that Miss Brazier would have had. Well, well it I. May have been the first, sorry, it may have been the first one. No, we don't know. Miss Brazier knew that she, wasn't, she might not get her conference on Monday morning. Well, I say that she should have known because her solicitor, who instructs her, was there on the 15th of February when the judge had been very clear uh, that the hearing should start but at 10 o'clock. The council had subsequently agreed a witness template filed with the court in accordance with Judge Subnara's order, presumably, which had provided for reading time. Wrongly, but that's what Miss Brazier would have seen. Yes, I absolutely sympathise with Miss uh, Brazier no criticism of her, but I do think that um, the legal team for the mother should have been alive to that. Uh, my recollection, I'll be correct if I'm wrong, is that um, the uh, witness template was simply the previous one prior to the hearing on the 15th of February, or, or at least that my own friend from the local authority had copied over that. I'm sorry, who's, if, the, if the witness template was wrong, Whose job was it to correct it? Well, it was our co collective job, and um, my again, my recollection I don't have my note of the advocates' meeting is that that was going to be changed. Yes, but, but by whom? Who, who, who failed to do it? Well, I, I don't wish to um, 
put blame on anyone, but it, it is usually the local authority who are who take charge of a witness template. Right. Okay. But I think we all okay. recognise that courts are busy, and um, as a general proposition, um, that there is a risk to assuming that there will be a reading warning unless categorically told that uh, by the trial judge at a pre-trial review or an, or an issues resolution mm. hearing. I certainly would never assume that. At what point in this, and forgive me for just keeping on about this point, at what point did the, your, did the Guardian um, state that she wanted to reserve her position until hearing evidence? When was that actually said? Um, that was after the advocates' meeting. Right. Because um, I remember there being discussions at the advocates' meeting, and I was effectively keeping my powder dry. I hadn't yet seen the Guardian's report, which was sent to me on the Friday, and I didn't know uh, what she would be recommending at that point or what her position right. would be. So that's obviously a relevant to considering what Miss Brazier's position would have been um, so she didn't know that she did so she didn't know at the advocates meeting on Thursday night that the Guardian was going to I'm going to say change her position and that change her position from supporting the local authority to reserving her position that's a it, well let's call I, that a change for the moment I do um, deal with the chronology of that within my skeleton yeah. argument because I don't think it's being reflected quite accurately enough. Um, the Guardian's position, as at the 9th of September, which was um, Anne Issues... Yeah, the, uh, the IR, well, it was Anne Issues Resolution Hearing. I think there were several. Okay. Um, was that um, she, uh, as a preliminary position, supported the local authorities' plans, but she had only very recently been allocated to the case there was a final report from her predecessor which supported the local <coughs> authorities' plans back in June of 2022. Um, she had only just come on board. Her preliminary view was that there was no reason to gainsay what her predecessor had put in her report. But obviously, um, several months passed from the 9th of September until the pre-trial review issues resolution hearing, whatever we describe it as, on the 15th of February, she was on leave at the time of that hearing, um, so I did not the, put the forward... The Judge Sapnara hearing? Yes. Yes. So I did not put forward a, a positive um, position on behalf of the Guardian at that hearing. I was mindful about the issues that were raised by the Guardian during the professionals meeting, which had taken place just before um, the Judge Sapnara hearing, um, I didn't know where that would lead in terms of the Guardian's position. So I was very careful um, not to state what her position was at that hearing, as I didn't have instructions to do so. So that is why I take issue with the way in which the change of position phrase is used. Yes. It is correct that there was a change of position from the 9th of September when the Guardian took a position in very specific circumstances of only just being allocated and a predecessor of having make, made a recommendation. But she quite properly, in my submission, um, it undertook significant further inquiries before uh, finalising her position and, and uh, reflecting yeah. that within her final report. I'm asking these questions not, as it were, to line up any possible criticism of the Guardian. For my part, I, that's not something I'm, I'm looking at. But I, it's as to whether it was fair mm. of the judge to refuse Ms. Brazier's request for time to talk to the client she'd not met yes. in a context mm. where the Guardian's position was had developed, yes. as you've described it, with the report being filed on the Friday after the advocate's meeting. Yes, and one always has sympathy for advocates who come into cases new and the ground shifts yes. at the time uh, they're taking over. I entirely forgive me for interrupting at this point. Say, I'm not so much concerned with the sympathy for Ms. Brazier, mm. although, of course, one has that. I'm concerned with the fairness from the mother's perspective. 
indeed. The judge's response to the request for more time um, was um, a fair one in my submission, in that she said, well, what is there to take um, instructions on? The Guardian's position at the outset of the hearing was that she wanted to hear the evidence before making a recommendation. How would, how would it have assisted um, the mother um, to be able to give instructions on what was effectively a wait-and-see position by the Guardian? How, um, on what does one need to take instructions was basically the judge's point. Let's get on then and hear the evidence um, so that the Guardian can then um, take a view and that can then be communicated to the mother, at which point she would need time in order to uh, give instructions, um, and indeed had time, because uh, between the examination <coughs> chief and the cross-examination, uh, there was, in my submission, ample opportunity to do so. One other question. This always brings back long-forgotten long memories of what it was like. <laughs> <laughs> Not very comfortable memories in some cases. But um, when, when did you know it was going to be allocated to Judge Hughes? Um, I think we found that out on the Friday. Mm. I don't know if it was by way of the email. I was trying to find the email, and I hope you'll forgive me for doing so during um, my low friend's submission. I couldn't find it. Um, but I think we thought it was going to be, at the time of the um, hearing before Judge Satnara on the 15th of February, we went into that hearing th thinking it would be Judge Satnara, which would have made sense for her then to have had the mm. pretrial review. We were told it wasn't going to be her. Um, I think we were told it was going to be a recorder, and I remember who it is, it's probably not relevant, but um, we thought we were going to have a recorder uh, for that week, and I think we all found out on the Friday it was going to be um, for a Judge Hughes KC. But my basic point is um, it's unsafe to make assumptions because the judge uh, case manages um, in a way that um, one should always be ready for. Mm. Um, so, as I say, I don't make criticism of Miss Brazier. She was in a very difficult position, uh, but a, a conference could and should have been arranged um, prior to that hearing, perhaps on the Friday afternoon or during that week for Miss Brazier to meet with the mother more generally prior to a um, significant trial, um, rather than risking it for the first morning of a hearing. Well, as I, I said, uh, we spent quite a lot more time on this particular part. I, I, for my part, I think the relevance now is that uh, we're looking at that as a, the overall as part of the overall challenge to the fairness of the hearing. So that's the point. Yes, um, and I think fairness is obviously one aspect of it apparent bias being another and I hear what is said about that um, but I think a general point that I would make and I don't know if it assists your lordships and, and um, your ladyship at all is that for my part I was in an interesting position during that week because I didn't know what the Guardian's recommendation would be um, so I was um, if not knew, I knew which areas the Guardian wished to be explored within the oral evidence um, and the reason for that, um, which um, clearly was an indicator of the concern that the Guardian had. And I was not therefore surprised um, by the Guardian's recommendation uh, to that extent. But from my position in the courtroom throughout the hearing, I did not know um, what the judge was going to decide. And I think that's probably the only useful, uh, potentially useful comment that I can make on that, because I, I, I did come to the hearing um, with um, obviously an interest in terms of um, the welfare of the children. I'm not uh, an objective, fair-minded observer in that sense, because I was engaged in the hearing. And it is very difficult, as I, I made the point within my skeleton argument, it's very difficult to be a fair-minded observer uh, when you have a case to run. And obviously, particularly by the time of the closing submissions, I had a very specific case to run, um, rather than the general one on behalf of the children. 
So I was uh, there to, um, to make arguments in a particular direction. So it is quite difficult um, to be uh, objective at that point, and uh, your lordships and your ladyship are uh, much better placed, especially having heard the recording, um, to be able to uh, make, to take a view on that. Um, in terms of that particular ground, um, ground E3, um, I um, am alive um, to the views expressed, having heard uh, the uh, recordings as well as having read the transcript. Um, I was present um, during that hearing. Um, it is difficult for opposing counsel, um, frankly, um, in those circumstances where a judge is being particularly interventionist uh, with um, one of the other advocates. Um, we've all been in that position. Um, there are different ways of coping when a judge is um, obviously putting the heat on um, in your particular case, and I, I do agree with the submissions that have been made, that it was a result of the way in which the evidence had um, come out during the hearing that there was um, more attention uh, on Mother's Council, perhaps by that stage, than on, on the other parties. Um, but it, it is difficult um, when one is in that position, um, one can come back at a judge um, and um, the more familiar one is with a particular tribunal, perhaps the easier it is. Um, I don't know if Miss Brazier had had any other hearings before, or Judge Hughes, KC. I've certainly had robust exchanges. I think she would again forgive me for saying um, it, in the past with her on occasions, um, and one um, battles on as best one can. But I know that's not the, the test um, for, for this appeal in terms of fairness and apparent bias. Um, and as I say, um, your lordships and your ladyship are better placed than I am. Um, but um, I think it would be helpful uh, from speaking to colleagues for there to be some guidance uh, as to what to do in those circumstances if, and I'm not suggesting that is the case here, but if there is um, an occasion when a judge is um, intervening more with one advocate than with another in a way that... Um, may become uh, uh, oppressive to that advocate as to how to address that. But I leave that to your lordships and your ladyship, depending on the decision uh, made at this hearing. You, you, you said a moment ago, Ms. Cheatham, that um, <clears throat> by the time of the closing submissions, um, a, a, a lot depended on the way the evidence had come out. Yes. But the, the difficulty with that may be that the way the evidence comes out submitted on behalf of the mother was dictated by the way the judge allowed it to come out. So on the one hand, stopping at Miss Brazier. On the other hand, uh, as Mr Schmidt has said, uh, taking over from him passages of the cross-examination of the mother. And I, I, I'd just like your help with two points, please. Uh, well, actually, three. You, 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 you said a moment ago that you didn't know what the judge was going to decide, but that presumably changed because you began your closing submission by saying, I take the hint. Well, yes, I. It, it's not clear from the transcript what was meant by that, and I didn't well, know if it would be appropriate I think it is to with explain respect. or not. I think it is with respect. Well, um, the judge said, do you want to say anything different? Um, and you said, well, I had five pages of the submissions, but I'll take the hint. Yes, I, I, there was a specific reason for that, and I'm not. Um, I'm, 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 I'm not, not criticising you. I'm just saying no. that um, sure, surely, on any objective reading of that, it, it's an indication by the judge, um, understandably accepted by you, that she doesn't really need to hear very much from you. That was certainly one interpretation, um, and uh, one that I had um, in mind. However, um, it was also in the context of us being quite late in the day by that point because the submissions had started, I think, mid-afternoon. Um, obviously, because of the interventions that there had been um, during the closing submissions on behalf of the mother, those were one outcome of that was that they were elongated in time and took much longer than they perhaps otherwise would have done. Um, the judge had heard the evidence of the Guardian um, 
into the afternoon of that day. And I know that a lot of judges at that point um, don't wish to hear much on behalf of a guardian because, as I think I said in my closing submission, she had, of course, only just heard that evidence, which was put very well by the guardian. But the other specific reason for that, and being mindful of the time of the day that it was, uh, was that it was my recollection um, that um, when I referred to the five pages that I had of bullet point submissions, um, the judge did not look thrilled at the prospect of hearing for me for the duration of uh, five pages worth. So um, obviously I don't know if that comes across um, in the recording. I haven't myself listened back to it. Um, but um, there was, um, it was a, in a sense a bit of a light-hearted exchange in the sense that um, she was perhaps expressing some horror at the prospect, and I will take it on the chin, but the prospect of her hearing at length uh, from me. Um, and I had obviously uh, taken a full part in the cross-examination of witnesses prior to that. So um, I think she was discouraging longevity. But I do accept that my interpretation of it alongside that uh, was that um, she was content with what she'd heard from the Guardian, that that didn't need um, to be um, expanded upon by me. So um, I, I, I took it in that benign light. I didn't think, I wasn't left with an impression that if I failed to say much, um, that um, that would prejudice my case. Uh, but having said that, um, I was mindful of the fact that the mother's submissions had taken up a lot of court time, um, that we were due to conclude the next day and that the judge would need thinking time before um, putting together her judgment and wish to conclude the closing submissions at the end of the Thursday. My preference is always um, rather laboriously to go through submissions, um, even with an indication such as that from a judge. Um, but obviously, um, I, I took the hint. <laughs> okay, thank you. And then you, you mentioned in the course of your submissions um, the, you, you described the Guardian's position at the start of the week as being wait and see. Yes. Um, do, do, do you want to say anything about the point I've raised with other counsel? Um, questioning how everyone's supposed to focus their evidence and questioning if, if nobody knows what the alternative is. Um, yes, my lord. Um, I did manage to find uh, within the trial bundle. Um, I don't have it as a separate document, I don't think. I'm sure that others could provide it to your lordships and your ladyship in due course if, if necessary. Um, but the final amended care plans that were produced after the hearing on the 15th of February before Judge Sapnara included what is described, and they were specifically directed to, to do this, a contingency placement plan. That's within... Uh, each of the children's final care plans. Um, that, that is, I, I, I can't pretend that it is a detailed plan in the same way that a pure care plan for which um, the main driver was uh, removal into foster care would be. Uh, but it does refer to the plan uh, for the children to be placed in long-term foster care uh, preferably with an in-house foster carer, and that given the strong bond between the children, uh, the local authority uh, would ensure that both children are placed together with an experienced foster carer who is able to provide them with an emotionally holding environment, and so on and so forth, um, and what is needed in terms of the foster carer's uh, experience and qualification. Uh, there is then reference to... Uh, the, uh, the being registered at a different GP surgery local if required and to, I'm looking at the younger child's care plan at this point um, and to the to, uh, to the transport to and from the school So the intention was that he would continue to attend the school Exactly, yeah. uh, the, the intention was that they would be placed together preferably 
in a foster placement that was in-house and therefore local so that they wouldn't need to change schools. Um, I, I accept it's not detailed in terms of what happens if um, the children do have to be separated, if they do have to um, change schools. Um, but that was, of course, an aspect of the case that was explored um, during the evidence, and um, particularly on behalf of The Guardian, um, who um, wanted all options to be explored. So, for example, with um, Dr. Banks, I asked questions about his, I think I used the word hierarchy, in terms of um, whether it would be better for the children to remain together in their mother's care or potentially to be in separate placements. The Guardian had wanted an exploration of the older child being perhaps in a um, residential school setting for term times and spending holidays uh, with her mother. So there were various options that were being explored during the evidence. I appreciate that there wasn't a clear care plan um, that could be used as the um, comparator, I think that word was used in a different context, but that um, in some cases there is obviously um, clarity as to exactly uh, what um, the, a foster placement would entail for children, but I'm afraid that is often not the case and that um, local authorities do not always um, have uh, long-term foster placements ready um, at the conclusion of a final hearing so that a, a, an exact um, comparison can be made, um, that often there is a generality in terms of foster care as a concept. The Guardian was very clear in um, her oral evidence that it would need to be carefully planned that the children would need to have um, discussions taking place in an honest way with them uh, by the professionals involved in their lives, that there would need to be exploration of any potential foster placement to ensure that it would be the right place for these children. She wasn't suggesting that the children should be um, rushed into effectively emergency placements at that stage, but rather that it should be a planned um, a, a, pl a planned uh, process of them moving to foster care. Indeed, at the time of the judgment, so in other words, overnight, as already been said on behalf of my loan friend for the local authority, the local authority had managed to find a placement for the younger child. There had been some pressure, it has to be said, all through the week, um, certainly from this end of the courtroom, uh, for them to... Um, explore uh, what placements would be available so that we would have more detail in time for the decision uh, by the judge. Um, but at the time of the uh, judgment, at the very least, we had some further information about a potential placement for the younger child. The social worker had um, experience <coughs> of that placement because he knew another child who had been placed there. He was very positive about that placement. Um, so although there would have been a, uh, a plan for the child to be introduced to the foster carer over the course of the next week, which was why <coughs> there was an agreement in any event to a stay of um, the, any removal prior to for, for the first seven days, because we knew that there would be um, a, a plan in place uh, for the younger child to meet with that foster carer. I have to accept that we didn't know what would be available for the older child, and that was obviously um, a source of frustration uh, for all parties, and particularly for the Guardian, um, that she uh, wouldn't be able to um, see before she finished her involvement in the case, um, ensure that it was the right kind of placement for the older child, that she had confidence in this uh, very experienced social worker who knew the children well, um, that he would ensure that it would be the right placement uh, for the older child. But of course, um, there was always going to be a difficulty in identifying a joint foster placement for these children. I appreciate what Dr. Banks said. He was very firmly of the view that they should be placed together and that that was potentially uh, supportive uh, to the placement. Uh, but because of the individual difficulties of the children, 
um, there was um, a reasonable prospect that that may not be possible. And that was the reason for me asking questions of Dr. Banks as to um, whether, if they can't be placed together, whether they should remain with their mother. Mm. And of course, his answer to that was no. Um, that if necessary, they should be placed separately, but with a significant contact uh, between uh, the siblings to ensure that their um, relationship, or the impact on their relationship, was mitigated so far as it was possible. But part of so does it follow from that that part of the uh, analysis which the judge had to carry out was to consider how that where the balance lay. Doctor yes. Banks had come to the view that if it came to the ultimately choosing between staying with mother and separate placements, then notwithstanding his view that the children should be together, they should be the, the separate places was preferable. Yes. But that was part of the analysis that the judge had to carry out. Yes. Is and it your case that she did? Yes. I, I, I don't think, again, I'll be correct if I'm wrong, but she wrote her judgment during the morning of the Friday, and I don't think she was apprised of uh, the new information about the availability of a foster placement for one but not both children yes. before her judgment. But she certainly from the exploration of the evidence um, would have been alive uh, to, to that prospect. Um, I accept yes. that... Um, my question is, sorry, sorry, forgive me, my question is where do we see, in the, do we see in the judgment, do you say, a sufficient analysis of this whole issue, where the balance lay, if the children were to be split? Yes. Um, Bearing in mind, I think we're clear, that there isn't any reference to the impact of change of circumstances in the judgment? Yes, I do, just generally in relation to the welfare checklist, I think I do concede that she doesn't go through each of the factors in an articulated way within her judgment. Um, I, I obviously make the point that for an experienced judge, she would have had them in the forefront of her, her mind. It would be, um, I think, you know, we were all confident that she was. Um, in terms of the impact of sibling separation, I believe it's at paragraph 29 that she makes reference to that within the judgment. Um, but I accept that she doesn't deal with that in detail within the judgment and indeed the risk of placement breakdown. Um, but what I say about that is that if there were um, elements of the judgment that were um, deficient or required clarification, um, then the proper course of action would have been to ask for there to be um, an elaboration or a clarification on those particular points. And, and, and that's how I respond to it within my um, skeleton argument, that those points should have been raised with the judge, albeit she was on leave the week after the hearing, um, but um, even parallel to the application to this court. Um, there could have been um, an, a, a request made um, to Her Honour Judge Hughes KC uh, for there to be um, clarification as to how those factors were weighed in the balance, and that would have been the proper course of action. Um, it's difficult. I Why? can't. Why would it have been the proper course to go back to the judge? You don't go back to a judge and say, oh, your reasoning's deficient, can you give us an opportunity to plug it? She's um, funked us. She's delivered her judgment. That's the end of it. She's funked us. She can't. Uh, she can possibly correct a mistake in, in, the, in the delivered judgment, but she can't go over it and say, oh, by the way, I forgot to give the following five reasons for what I came to, and uh, counsel has asked me to do it. I, I just don't follow that submission at all. Well, my lady, that's certainly what we're encouraged to do um, in the event of there being gaps in a judgment, matters that are not dealt with. Well, there's um, been a lot of case law recently about yes. this. Well, I, I gather. You know, but <laughs> nothing from me um, about how this is... It's difficult. It, it is becoming the practice in almost every case for this to happen. Mm. Whether um, it's a good thing or not, obviously the preference is to have a full judgment uh, with everything dealt with so that it's very clear that a judge has weighed everything in the balance. And I take the point um, that it's um, more than can be more than just a, a, a gap um, in a reason that is still present. Um, 
I think that was the point that um, my lady was making. Um, but uh, that is certainly the way in which I have always understood we are we're encouraged to deal with things at the first point. Well, I, I understand that if, if, for example, an issue hasn't been addressed, there is a specific issue before the court and the judge has said nothing on it at all, then there's a, a body of case law that says the first port of call is to go back to the judge and say, you didn't um, actually rule on this particular issue. Please, can we know what your thinking is? Because by the time it gets to the Court of Appeal, we're then all speculating yeah. if we don't know the judge's line of thinking. But I think that the, the, the point I was exploring with you is that there is a distinction between that sort of scenario and plugging reasoning. Yes. Um, I don't, for my part, think that they are necessarily at odds with each other, that mm. um, she's, she's come to a conclusion here as to what is in the children's best interests. Um, if an aspect of the reasoning is missing, I don't, for my part, think that there is a problem with them um, asking of the trial judge, well, how how have you factored this into your reasoning? Well, but anyway. that's that's the slippery slope, I think, because, mm. um, yeah. as I said, in whatever judgment it was a few weeks ago, it's, one sees so many requests for clarification, in which, in which the judge has asked, what weight did you give to this? Yeah. Factor that. Uh, well, I've said what I've said about that. Well, it, it, it's <laughs> difficult and, and onerous for judges too. But um, I have to accept that she didn't deal um, in any explicit way with the risk of a placement breakdown. She does deal in part with um, sibling separation. I do take issue with the point that is still being made on behalf of the appellant uh, about the separation from the baby brother. Uh, because I make the point in my skeleton argument that that was a, a matter that was addressed with the mother during her oral evidence. And it was her case that um, her partner had a separate property, um, although he was staying with her for um, obviously um, much of the week, but that he had a separate property and that pl the plan was for the baby brother to live with her partner yeah. and not with her. Yeah, that's what's in. So um, I... I do not think that that is a valid point, but the separation of um, the uh, two older siblings is clearly um, something that the Guardian needed to consider, and in my submission the judge did to the extent that she um, puts that within paragraph 29 of her judgment. But it didn't really, I mean, it wasn't the real question here for the judge, well what is, the, is it, well, I might say the least bad option, what is the option for these, best option for these children, staying with the mother or being placed in specific foster placements. Yes. I, it, was it possible for the judge to come to the right conclusion from the children's point of view <coughs> without knowing as clearly as possible what the placements were going to be in terms of how far apart they were going to be, if they were apart, first of all, were they going to be apart? If so, how far apart? What contact arrangements would there be possible? How about the grandparents and also the schooling issue? I've seen I, I, the address, I presume, is the address in East London where the child is going to school. I won't say where, but, but that is that all these things had to be part of the evaluation, didn't they? And they, well, and they, and they weren't. On that latter point, um, the younger child was going to the school that was some distance from the family home and yes. was being taken by well, a taxi. I, I so as long that. as he was in the, the area generally, um, there was a, a prospect of him being able to continue mm. at that school, and indeed we knew he could. In terms of the, the point that your Lordship uh, makes, that the, the, the specifics of the arrangements and the placements is something that the judge needed to know. Unfortunately, we do not always have that no, information at the time of the decisions being made. The Guardian's recommendation uh, was that uh, given the difficulties that there were uh, for the children remaining in their mother's care and the risks of actual physical harm um, because of what had happened and the evidence as it came out, um, that uh, any foster placement um, provided that the social worker had uh, made investigations to ensure it was 
uh, with an experienced carer, that was what counted most, so that the children's emotional needs could be met, um, that that would be uh, better for these children, or, or necessary, that it was required because of the risks of the children, so that that is what needed to happen for the children, and that there would need to be some trust placed in the local authority to ensure that they were as good as possible for the children in terms of the other aspects of their um, care needs, including contact, education, contact with um, grandparents and, and, and so forth. So um, unfortunately, that is often the way, that we are not given full information about foster placement. Sometimes it's because children have been removed already, but are in short-term or medium-term placement. Um, and indeed the local authority can't undertake their matching process, as I understand it, with a long-term carer until after a final <coughs> hearing. So there is often uncertainty even then uh, when children are not facing the um, anguish of being removed from a parent's care and the huge change that it has to be acknowledged that that engenders. Uh, but even if they're in foster placement, um, their future in terms of... Um, where they will remain in the care system is um, not always known and guardians have to make recommendations with an element of uncertainty and, and judges make decisions with that uncertainty as well. It's regrettable but the reality of um, what happens in, in these hearings and the alternative of adjourning that final hearing which had of course been listed since September 2022 in the context of a case that had been running for 18 months by the time that we reached a final hearing with a prospect of not being able to secure a further five days for a final hearing at the Central Family Court until likely well into 2024. I know that when I was doing other cases around the time of that hearing, Cases were being listed in February of 2024. That is the reality that when a hearing is lost, um, all parties, and in particular the children, are faced with the prospect of a huge delay in terms of decision-making about their future care. It was in the context of uh, Dr. Banks giving evidence that um, he used the term bounce-back family, that his uh, fear was that um, if the children were not removed to foster care, um, that they may, in any event, um, not be able to remain in the mother's care for a range of reasons. So it was in that context that the judge was, I had to accept making difficult decisions. This was not an easy case for any of us. And I suspect certainly not for the judge, which um, I, I'm sure to an extent explained the, the heavier than usual level of intervention that she was making uh, during times the hearing because it wasn't going to be an easy decision. Um, the Guardian had not started the hearing with a clear recommendation which um, obviously uh, for, in some cases can assist a court um, but uh, needed to hear the evidence before she could make her recommendation. Um, it was a case in which the local authority uh, were favouring the children remaining in the care of their mother at the outset of the hearing uh, but um, readily accepted uh, and one assumes that's partly in the context of the way in which the evidence went, uh, accepted the judge's decision at the conclusion of the hearing. That is symptomatic of the, the difficult decisions that had to be made in this case. Can I just ask you to, to clarify something about the, the timetable? Because um, I think you submitted earlier on in, in answer to um, some questions from my Lord uh, about the... Uh, start of the hearing and it's starting at 10 o'clock or 10.30 rather than yes, the yes. afternoon, uh, that um, there wasn't very much uh, that counsel for the mother could really have said uh, or, or taken instructions on whilst your client was understandably making her mind up as to which way to go. Uh, but that once that mind was made up and it was indicated that there was an ample opportunity, I think is the way you put it, to uh, take instructions then and to prepare to um, test the, the water. Um, if one looks at the transcript, uh, I see that your client went into the witness box at 4.14. Yes. 
in the afternoon after the judge had indicated that she wasn't going to go beyond the evidence in chief yes. overnight uh, and was then examined by you. And that's the point, as I understand it, at which she firmly came down in favour of um, uh, the foster care um, option. Uh, and, and she explains herself uh, uh, at some detail. And she finishes at 4.44, uh, sort of quarter to five in the evening. And the judge says, we'll resume at 10.30 the next day. Uh, and then one looks at the transcript for the next day, and in fact, it started at 10.57. But my reading of the transcript was that it only started at 10.57 because um, the, the mother's partner um, had... Um, uh, an emergency or, or her had an operation uh, and um, the mother was trying to uh, get um, that all sorted out uh, but it wasn't as a, a result of any request by council for further time is that right um, I think that is right my lady yes um, of course the judge wouldn't have known that so no. when she suggested that we could start at 10 30 um, the next morning, um, she, she didn't know that that would lead to difficulties, for example, from 9 until 10.30. No. But of course, we did get a bonus half hour, in effect, um, because we didn't start till 11 o'clock. And I'm afraid that is the reality of trials, mm. that one has to deal with matters as best one can within the court timetable. And we could see by that point that we were going to use the entire week. Um, the other point that um, I make within my skeleton argument, I think, my lady, is that um, although, um, of course, the mother needed to talk through the guardian's <coughs> position um, with her counsel um, after the, the guardian had made her recommendation, her recommendation was based on the evidence that had been um, aired throughout the week, and in particular the questions that had been put on behalf of the Guardian to various witnesses. So I would hope that there would have been no surprises in terms of um, the reasons for the Guardian mm. reaching her views, because they were in part the result of my questions and the responses given uh, by the witnesses um, that uh, I, I had asked questions with which the Guardian was concerned. And, and that was obviously the um, flag um, to, to the Mother's Council. There had been lots of opportunities during the week to have discussions uh, with the Mother uh, on those issues as they came up during the hearing. And as I say, I think in my skeleton argument, there was nothing factually new that the Guardian said on which instructions were needed. It was only the recommendation, of course, the position that the Guardian took was one that had been advocated on behalf of one of the other parties in any event um, at each of the previous hearings, including that trial, because that was what the father thought should happen uh, to, uh, to the children. Um, so uh, the other point that I did try to convey within my skeleton argument is that um, in terms of apparent bias and unfairness, um, that actually um, we all struggled with one decision. The respondent parties uh, to this appeal struggled with the fact that we were presented with a statement from the mother during the course of the evidence of Dr. Banks. I think it was handed round to us in paper form at about 11 o'clock whilst Dr. Banks was giving his evidence. Um, that raised a number of matters. Uh, within that statement on which we all needed to take instructions and consider in the context of imminently starting our cross-examination cross of the mother who was due to start her evidence at two o'clock that afternoon. And of course, the judge gave us no additional time. Um, I don't criticize her for it, but in that sense, that was potentially um, much more unfairness to us and we um, went along with it because we didn't want to cause any delay and one does as a trial advocate just crack on with things um, and, and deal with things as best we can but that was a difficulty for the other advocates and in terms of the impression the apparent bias uh, by a, a judge um, one could see that as being um, a, a, a evidence if one were looking for it um, of uh, 
the judge causing difficulties for the other parties and favouring the mother. So um, I, I only make that point in that context that, of course, there are difficulties at different times during trials. Um, we all do our best to deal with them. We raise objections at times um, when we feel that our client's case is being prejudiced by that. Uh, but uh, in fact, um, my learned friend for, for the mother, Miss Brazier, had much more time in which to consider her cross-examination of the guardian um, than some of the other parties in relation to the mother. I think I was fortunate in having an overnight. Um, uh, what, what, one, just one final matter, please, Miss Cheatham, I'd like your help with. In paragraph 15 of the judgment, <coughs> um, which is a very long paragraph, I'm looking at page 147 of the bundle, about, about 10 lines down, this is um, dealing with the evidence of Dr. Banks. Um, and the, the reference to if the local authority had a supervision order and reduced the support. Can, can you help me with this? What, what, why would, if a supervision order is in place, why, why would the local authority reduce the support in a way which gave rise to risks? Um, I'm not sure if that is in the context of uh, there being a very high level of um, support uh, to the mother that there had been uh, during the proceedings and uh, particularly the fact that um, th this particular, I'll be correct if I'm wrong in terms of the context of that, this particular social worker who gave um, very positive evidence uh, about the mother, but it was clear from his evidence that he had worked very hard at being able to um, work with the mother in a way that uh, some professionals had struggled. So the fact that it was contingent on um, the individual social worker concerned in a way that was um, right. fragile for the children. I'm not sure if that was the context for that comment. Well, um, I, I wonder, because when we get to paragraph 27 of the judgment, five lines down, the judge says she agrees with Dr. Banks that when support slash supervision is withdrawn, part of the scaffold will collapse. And excuse me, what's, if there's a supervision order in place in the interest of the children, um, why is it going to be withdrawn? Well, I, because um, supervision orders have a, a limited limit. longevity. Right. Um, they can only be for one year and then be renewed oh, for a further two years. But, but, but what, and it seems to have been assumed that whatever the state of the, the children's welfare was, it, it would be removed. I, I just forgive me, maybe my ignorance. I don't understand why everyone's proceeding on the basis that the local authority would simply say, well, there we are, we've, we've done our year, that's the end of that. I don't think. Um, Anyone, including I don't, I can't speak for Dr. Banks, but I don't know if he was assuming that. But there are, of course, vulnerabilities um, to um, a, a hefty reliance being placed on um, yeah. a local authority or a particular professional, uh, where there are um, safeguarding concerns about children, yeah. and to and to be reliant on that um, is obviously a risk to families when resources yeah, so, um, are um, under strain. But, fully understand that. It's just that the judge, as, as I read that sentence, the judge is working on the basis that support supervision will be withdrawn. Um, I, I know that there was, uh, and it's within paragraph 27, the reference to the scaffold. <coughs> Scaffolding was a term that was used um, during the evidence, particularly Dr. Banks. Um, and there was a concern at the level of support upon which the mother relied um, and the fragility of that. Uh, right. There was certainly a concern that it was um, this particular very hard working but also very gentle um, and um, accommodating social worker that had <coughs> managed to, um, as social workers in his position can sometimes do, bring out the best in the mother but also put up with a great deal of um, the uh, difficulties that she put his way, if I can 
put it that way, um, and that that, that 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 is a fragile situation for a family um, in the near future, but also in the longer term future. So I think Dr. Banks had been speaking about the longer term for these children and their prospects and the trajectory uh, upon which they were travelling at the time of the final hearing and his view that there was a need for intervention. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That, that's very helpful indeed. Right. Um, I, sorry. Ms. Ojudiku, do, do you have submissions in reply? I'm just thinking about timing overall. My Lord, would you rather I did? Um, I came back at two o'clock. Well, it, there are only three short matters. Well, should we, should we hear the three short matters and then we'll review where we're up to? Yeah. I'm grateful. Yeah. Um, my Lord, with regard to the witness template, my instructing solicitor attended the hearing before her honour judge sat Nara, uh, and there was a witness template drafted which allowed for the reading time um, in the morning of the first uh, first day of the contested hearing. Um, she wasn't at the advocates meeting, but saw no other witness template. Yes. Um, secondly, the comparison made by my learned friend for the children um, in the context of fairness and or bias between the mother being permitted to adduce a statement at the hearing um, and the matters raised in ground E um, of the skeleton argument on behalf of the appellant um, are, in my respectful submission, an unfair and disproportionate comparison. Um, there's nothing to suggest that any of the parties sought to adduce a statement um, and were refused from so doing by the learned judge. Um, that is very different to the matters raised um, in Ground D, especially with regard to the closing submissions made by Ms. Brazier. Um, and finally, my Lord, um, the point in respect to going back to the learned judge to seek clarification or indeed effectively seeking um, a rewriting of the decision, so to speak, um, was recently addressed in Re, C, D and E, Adequacy of Reasons, um, 2023 EWCA Civ 334. A decision of... Um, it was. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> <laughs> I accept that submission. <laughs> Right. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. We'll, we'll just rise to consider the, the overall timetable. <clears throat> I 
very grateful to all, all the advocates for the assistance they've given us this morning. <coughs> uh, it's just coming up to five past one. W what we intend to do is to rise now till 2.15. We think we may be in a position at least to inform the parties of our decision at 2.15, though the giving of detailed reasons will ha have to await uh, a written judgment or judgments. So we'll, we'll meet again um, at 2.15. Are we then not back to where we were?